little pig! <coughs> So the spotlight is once again shone on the grey area of homeowners' rights to protect their properties. This isn't right. The three little pigs are the victims. Three down two houses. We've got what you did. But the pigs went too far. You have every right to defend your property. chin chins up, fellas. Boiling someone alive hardly constitutes reasonable force. Somebody is going to break the law and intrude on you. Yeah, protect yourself in your own home. A man's home is his castle. You've got a family Someone tried to blow my house down. I'll do the same. I knew the wolf. There's no way you could have blown down those houses. He had asthma. But the wolf had asthma. So what's the truth about the pig's houses being blown down? Inside job. There's no reason why those two houses, one made from straw, the other from wood, should have collapsed. Not even a healthy wolf's huff and puff could bring them down. The three little pigs have confessed to conspiring to commit insurance fraud, framing the wolf in an attempt to cover their tracks. Their motive was financial, as they struggled to keep up with their mortgage <coughs> payments. Guilty. I can empathize with the I'm piece. behind on my payments too. I just How could this have happened? I've lost everything. Well, welcome back to Wednesday Night Bible Study. And uh, wow, what a victim the wolf is. I always thought the three little pigs were the victims, but I realized I had it wrong all my life, and it's the poor wolf. And, and I think in that opening uh, video sequence, uh, advertising The Guardian and, and demonstrating that the media understand what we should understand, and that is how powerful narrative is. That people really don't know what to think until they have a narrative to give them context as to what they're looking at. And that really, as we finish off, we got halfway through Luke 16 uh, last week. We're going to finish off Luke 16 this week. And really Luke 15 and 16 is all about the power of the narrative. And I think you'll see that very clearly as we finish uh, Luke chapter 16. We'll open with a word of prayer and then we'll get right into the study. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we praise you, Lord. We thank you so much for your holy days. Uh, that give us the biblical narrative and enable us to understand what is happening in our world. And now, Father, as we have celebrated Pentecost and the founding of the church, we now look forward to trumpets, the return of Christ. And we know 2,000 years after the founding of the church, we are very close now to the fulfillment of the Feast of Trumpets. Even so, please, Father, hasten the return of Christ. We thank you, Lord. We know that much turmoil will happen between now and then uh, but father we look forward to the establishment of the kingdom as we learn so much about that through luke's writing bless us now father with deeper understanding we pray in jesus name amen well let's get straight into the uh, study for today which is uh the back half of luke 16 and so we'll just pick up from luke 12 16 12 and it says here you know if we've not been faithful in what is another man's, and we understood last week that uh, we're, we're living temporary lives today. And really everything that we have, uh, we are just stewards of what belongs to God. And God wants us to use his property in a very specific way, uh, in a charitable way, looking out for others and, and advancing his, his cause. But what we saw is that there's really two camps. There are those who believe God, and are faithful in their stewardship and there are those who are not and uh, clearly the Pharisees and the scribes are not faithful in their stewardship uh, they are serving themselves and they are not serving God and beginning in Luke chapter 12 verse 1 uh, Christ turned to the disciples and to us by extension and said beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and so from that verse, Luke 12, 1, all the way through, we've been marching all the way through these chapters, what, we're, what, what Christ is exposing to the disciples, and again to us by extension, is this leaven of hypocrisy. And so here we see that, you know, they are not faithful with what God has given them, 
And so who will give uh, to us what is our own if we're unfaithful? And what is our own is what we inherit in the kingdom of God. And that inheritance is a permanent and an eternal inheritance. But God will not give us that if we cannot prove to be faithful with what we have in this life. He then went on to say, No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. And so, again, this is exposing the hypocrisy of these scribes and the Pharisees, and not all of them, but the majority of them, that they are really serving money. And these would be, you know, t I think in today's equivalent, we would think of them perhaps as um, technologists out of Silicon Valley who are making billions of dollars. And that's just the economy we live in today, that if you can found a, a software company that's really valuable, uh, then you are, you know, the titans of the earth. Well, back in this society, if you knew the law, and you were a Pharisee or a scribe, uh, you could be extremely wealthy. And so Christ is calling them out that they're not serving God. They can't serve God in money. And they've chosen to serve money. And then he started to speak these parables to expose this hypocrisy. Now, Luke gives us a side note to make sure we don't miss the point. He says, now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money. So Christ says you can't serve money and God. And Luke tells us, oh, by the way, the Pharisees, they're lovers of money. So they're not serving God. They're serving themselves. They also heard all these things. So Christ is speaking to the disciples and to the multitude. And the Pharisees are listening in. And they derided him. They just, uh, they hated him for this. And so, you know, they're listening to this. And he's undermining their credibility. And so they're, they're just really insulting him and just trying to bring down his credibility. And he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men. But God knows your hearts. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. And this is something, brethren, that we have to be very, very aware of. Because we can get confused. We can uh, see things that are highly esteemed among men and think that, that, well, it must be esteemed among God. But we've got to see things the way God sees them. And that's what Christ is doing here in, in chapters 15 and 16, is he's helping his disciples to see things the way God sees them. So he goes on now to say, The law and the prophets were until John. So the law, we have the establishment of Israel with Moses. Then we had Elijah begin the age of the prophets. And then the second Elijah, John the Baptist, end the age of the prophets. And, and the law, which was the foundation of the covenant with Israel. And then all of the prophets from Elijah to John were pointing to the time when God would fulfill all these prophecies and establish the kingdom of Israel and restore the kingdom to Israel. So the law and the prophets were until John. Now, as, as John finishes his ministry and Christ begins his, and we saw that, we really did see that in, um, we saw this in, which chapter was this? It was Luke, Luke chapter four. Uh, in Luke chapter four, when we were there, if you'll recall, that is when Christ overcame the devil. And so he was baptized in Luke 3, and then in Luke 4 he overcame the devil, and then he began preaching the kingdom of God and fulfilling Isaiah 61.4 and actually telling the, the uh, Jewish community then that this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. So that was in, in Luke 4. So, so that's, that's really where Christ began his ministry, and that's where he says that the law and prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God has been preached. And that was what he, he opened in Isaiah 61 and just said, this has been fulfilled in, in, before you. And so this is now the time of the kingdom of God being preached and, and people being warned about this. And everyone who gets it, those who have an ear to hear, are now pressing into it. We realize this is real. This is happening. The wicked have no clue what's happening. But, but the, those whom God is calling and, and, and teaching, 
we understand what is happening. And so we're throwing ourselves. You can't serve God and money. You can't, you can't have two masters because you're going you're gonna to love one or you're going to hate the other, but you're not gonna, you can't be loyal to both. They're, they're, they're in two different directions. So we decide who we are loyal to, who we are serving, and we, we who are kingdom people, we are serving God and we're not double-minded. And so we are pressing into with all, our, with all of our might, loving God with all of our soul and all of our might. And that's why Christ, by the way, says, you know, if you don't uh, love, uh, hate everything, even your own life, uh, and, and you, cannot, you don't put me before everything, you cannot be my disciple. Clearly, he's telling us he is God because he's taking us away from idolatry and he's telling us don't have anything before me because he is God. He is the creator. And so we, we, are put, we, are, we are putting away idolatry and we are putting him first. And so he says here, uh, everyone is pressing into it. It is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one tittle of the law to fail. This is, this is an amazing verse. This is showing us the permanence of the law. And people want to come, all different types of uh, religions, including Christianity, want to come and say the law is done away. Christ's words are, it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one tittle of the law to pass away, to fail. So the law is, is established. Now this is really strange uh, in the kind of first reading. So after establishing that the law is permanent, he then, it seems like he changes subjects. He just suddenly says, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced from her husband commits adultery. Now, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I, I kind of looked at this and said, you know, what does this mean? He, he's talking about uh, being faithful to God, pressing into the kingdom of God, and, and the law not failing. And then suddenly he starts talking about marriage and divorce, or specifically divorce. So I think a couple of things here. One is, you know, the scribes and Pharisees, they love money. They're lovers of money. They're covetous. They're very evil men. So if they're evil men, we can only imagine how they're treating their wives. And, and in fact, this would be, not be a surprise because the Old Testament ends with Malachi saying to uh, Israel uh, that, that uh, you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth. So when you're young and you're in love and you marry, uh, God is witness between you and the wife of your youth with whom you have dealt treacherously, yet she is your companion and your wife by covenant. But did, not, did he not make them one, having a remnant of the spirit, and why one? He seeks a godly offspring. So the marriage covenant is there because God seeks a godly offspring. Therefore, take heed to your spirit, and let none, none, zero, deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce, for it covers one's garment with violence. He hates divorce, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that you deal not treacherously. So I think one interpretation here of what Christ is doing is he's again exposing the leaven of the Pharisees. They're standing there high and mighty and he's looking at them and he sees them for what they are. And he wants his disciples to see them for what they are. They are treacherous, covetous, money-loving, evil men. Even though they're dressed very religiously and they're, they're administrating the law and, and Christ is saying, look, nothing of the law will fail. And I know specifically how you are treating your wives and, and how you divorce your wives and pursue your lusts. And I'm calling you out on it. So I think that that certainly makes sense. And I believe that that is certainly very appropriate. But Malachi says that he, he why is he concerned about this? And why did he make the two one? Because he seeks a godly seed. So marriage has profound implications and symbolism. And Christ says he's married to Israel. And so I think what he's saying here on, on the heels of saying that 
the kingdom of God is preached since John, on the heels of saying that, he says here, when we, when we read earlier, that he says, since that time the kingdom of God has been preached and everyone is pressing into it. It's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one title of the law to fail. And then suddenly whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. I think another interpretation of what's going on here is Christ is telling them, look, I'm married to Israel. So as treacherous as you are, the law cannot fail. And the covenant that I have with Israel cannot fail. And if I were to drop Israel and go and marry another nation, that would be adultery. And I am faithful. So no matter what, the kingdom is going to be established in Israel because Israel is my wife. She's the wife of my youth. You could put it that way. She's the wife of the covenant. And so I think he's telling them here, the kingdom will be established in Israel. But as he said earlier, that uh, the children of Abraham uh, would, be, would come into the, uh, the kingdom, but they themselves would be thrust out. So God is going to establish the kingdom in Israel, but they will be thrust out. And God will be faithful to the wife of covenant. So I think this is another interpretation here. Now, marriage means so much to God. And if we look at some of the scriptures that, that give us the context of how God sees marriage, because he says that through Malachi, he hates divorce. He hates divorce. Divorce equ he equates with violence. It's a form of violence. And so here, let's just review some of the law that will never fail. He says in Leviticus 19, verse 2, Speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord, your God, am holy. So these instructions in Leviticus are there to teach the nation how to be like God, how to be holy like God. And being faithful in marriage is being holy like God. He says, Every one of you shall revere his mother and his father, and keep my Sabbaths, I am the Lord your God. So you see God moving now and acting to protect the family and ensure that the mother and father are honored so that the father and the mother are loyal and faithful to each other and the children are respectful to their mother and father. And this becomes the building, the building block of a functional and faithful and holy society. In verse 4 he says, Do not turn to idols nor make yourselves molded gods. I am the Lord your God. Now, how did God see women? If we look at John 4, verse 25, the woman said to him, this is a Samaritan woman, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. I am the Messiah. And at this point, so while he's talking to her at this point, his disciples came and they marveled. This was jaw-dropping. They marveled that he talked with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? Their jaws dropped. So this society now, this Jewish customs with the Pharisees, they started to treat women poorly. The Creator comes to earth and he speaks to the woman as an equal. And he's happy to speak with her and engage her and teach her and have women as his disciples. And so he's trying to set these people straight and set his disciples straight around how he sees women. But they, they were stunned. And now look in 1 Corinthians 7. Again, protecting the marital bond. Paul instructs the Corinthians, Let the husband render to his wife the affection due to her and likewise also the wife to her husband. So within the marriage, there should be frequent and, and very loyal uh, intimacy. And that's the only place. In, in the godly uh, society, intimacy only occurs within the marriage. And because of that, husband and wife grow closer and closer together over time. Our society has it completely backwards. 
everybody and anybody is having intimacy except the married couple. The, the married couple is just ice. It's cold. And, and this is the opposite of what God wants. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And it's not one way. Look at the rest of this. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. There's this mutual arrangement where it's not the husband who can just dominate the wife and do whatever he wants with her, and, and her body is just his property, as the Pharisees thought, and as all evil men think. God is saying, no, you are together. It's a union. It's, it's, it's the building block. It's the foundation of society. Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time. So mutual consent that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. And when you do that, that, that uh, you want to draw closer to God, you want to address, you want spiritual focus. When you do that, come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. And it's important for me to mention here that any sexuality, any sexuality outside of marriage serves the devil. So whether you're involved in adultery, fornication, pornography, anything, it is all tied to idolatry. These are the ways that the ancient peoples worshipped their idols. Remember when Israel got all mixed up with uh, worshipping Baal uh, at, at Peor? It was all uh, an orgy because this is how Satan is worshipped. And so the Christian is very careful not to get involved in this idolatry and this, this worshipping of, idol, of, of idols and worshipping of the devil and remains faithful within marriage. So even the husband and wife who are faithful in marriage, if they agree for a time to focus spiritually, it's with mutual consent, and then Paul instructs them immediately come back together because the devil is constantly working to destroy marriage. Now, in Matthew 10, the Pharisees came to Christ testing him and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? So they wanted to understand what, what are the boundaries around divorce. And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? So Christ takes them all the way back to the beginning, right back to Genesis to show them that the human being was made from the beginning one man and one woman. That that was the divine intent. And he's the creator. He's the one who created them. And he's telling them this is the divine purpose and intent that one man and one woman come together. There's, there's tremendous uh, spiritual meaning in this. And he said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, and he's respectful to that family unit. And then he leaves and he creates his own family unit and be joined to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. This was the instruction right from the beginning. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate or let not Satan separate. So God is the one that joins and, and Satan is going to try to destroy this. So when they're seeking this easy divorce, Christ is letting them know this does not come from God. They said to him, why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? So there's a, a procedure that they have from Moses as to how they can divorce their wives. And he said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. So Moses had this society that he was looking after, and uh, he had to make judgments. And, and there was these terrible situations occurring that it looked like it was uh, just not viable for them to live together in peace. And so his judgment as the leader of the nation was to permit divorce, and he gave um, a procedure as to how they could do it. But Christ is saying that was because of them. That was because of, of the impossible task that they put in front of Moses, trying to solve these problems. And so he permitted it, but put a procedure around it. But from the beginning, this was not God's intent. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, this is now the creator speaking, 
whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality. So, so she or he, or in this case it would be she, has, has allowed for sexual immorality to, to come into the union. That's the only reason. And marries another, commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced, commits adultery. This is how much God hates divorce. So he just makes it very clear from the beginning, it's one man and one woman coming together in a permanent, a permanent arrangement. So he says here, in verse uh, 4 of chapter 13, marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. I, I think we're getting the impression here that marriage and family and stability in marriage and family means a great deal to God. It's a very high priority. So if it's a great deal to God, a big deal to God and a high priority, we can expect the opposite from the devil. In fact, it's going to be a priority to the devil to destroy marriage. Marriage is honorable among all and the bed, whatever happens in the marriage bed between the husband and wife, it's undefiled. But any other relationship, any other sexual relationship, is idolatry. And so fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Now, we go back to Leviticus and holy living. And he gives some very specific instructions to protect marriage and the union between a husband and wife. None of you shall approach anyone who is near of kin to him to uncover his nakedness. I am the Lord. So incest is out. Again, protecting the family unit and, and, and building the society so that it's healthy and functional. No incest. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's brother. You shall not approach his wife. She is your aunt. Again, be very clear, no incest. Nor shall he go near any dead body necrophilia is out and all of these acts are idolatry any any deviation here gives honor to the devil intimacy within the marriage the husband and wife gives honor to god it's that simple nor shall he go near any dead body nor defile himself for his father or his mother if any man lies with his uncle's wife he has uncovered his uncle's nakedness. They shall bear their sin. They shall die childless. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your daughter-in-law. So now not just your aunt, but your daughter-in-law. So your son's wife. She is your son's wife. You shall not uncover her nakedness. If a man lies with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall surely be put to death. They have committed perversion. Their blood shall be upon them. The man who commits adultery with another man's wife, he who commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulterer, adulteress, shall surely be put to death. Verse 9. For everyone who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. He has cursed his father or his mother. His blood shall be upon him. Do you get the sense here, as I do, that the family unit matters a great deal to God. And he's making it very clear as he's establishing this nation of Israel, do not mess with the family. And so here, if a son curses his mother or his father, he's to be put to death. You shall not walk in the statutes of the nation which I am casting out before you, for they commit all these things, and therefore I abhor them. So by looking into the law, which Christ said shall never fail, not, not a tittle of it shall fail. So by looking into the law and, and understanding how much God hates divorce, meaning he loves family, he loves marriage, and it was designed from the beginning, we need to understand that Satan is the opposite. Satan is doing everything he can to destroy family and marriage. And right now we have this whole um, Marxist movement, this global Marxist movement, these neo-Marxists 
all around the world in, in positions of power. And we just have to look at the goals of the communists, the Marxist goals, and read the Communist Manifesto to understand their agenda. And these are really immoral people. These are terribly immoral people. And their agenda is to destroy the family so that the state, the government, can raise our children and make our children immoral from an early age. And so we're seeing legislation pass in these various nations that make divorce easy. God hates divorce, they love divorce. We're seeing legislation pass that, that uh, authorizes and, and legitimizes all kinds of sexual deviance. We're seeing legislation pass that authorizes institutions like schools to morally co corrupt our children at the earliest of ages, like Bill C-89 here in Canada, and to prevent ch parents from having any say in the matter. In fact, if parents do not uh, comply, the children will be taken out of the home. So these are the Marxists, and they're winning. They're winning. We do not know or understand the implications of homosexual marriage. It has, it has never been done before. It is unprecedented. In, in the thousands of years of human history, this has never been. And, and now that we've accepted this, it's going to open the door to all kinds of unions. If, if, if we authorize, and, and as we have accepted homosexual marriage, why can't we have polygamy? Why can't we have polyandry? Uh, all of these other uh, types of relationships now become equally legitimate. And if our children, at the earliest of ages, are being programmed and wired to think all of this is perfectly normal, and they have no idea that in the thousands of years of human history, this has never been done. No society has ever done this. And so they grow up now thinking this is perfectly normal. And this, you know, if you read Brave New World, this is exactly what Aldous Huxley was warning about. And so now we've opened, thanks to these the neo-Marxists, we have destroyed the validity of marriage and the, the stability that a loyal and faithful couple who the, the loyal to their covenant, this man is loyal to the wife of his youth. And this is what God wants and this is this is the foundation of society. But now we're opening up to all kinds of definitions of marriage. And so if homosexuals can marriage marry, why can't the Muslim who their scriptures say that they can have up to four wives, what right do we have as a society to say to them, no, you cannot do that? Uh, they, they are equally, um, how should I say, entitled to their marriages if homosexuals can marry. And so we're going to start seeing this. And, and in fact, in the UK, one of the big problems that we have with these types of um, uh, lowering our standards or, or not upholding the Christian standard. Uh, we're allowing now all kinds of definition of marriage. And we've got to understand these marriages have a completely different agenda. It is not about a, a loving family with, with uh, children who honor their parents and, and, and are loyal to their parents and then grow up and, and choose a, a husband or a wife and build another family unit. These children are trained the devout ones, from, from birth, the moment they're born, it's whispered into their ear that Muhammad is God's prophet and, and there's no God but Allah. And, and they're trained for jihad. One, with so many of these women, their, their biggest hope because of their scriptures is that their child would become uh, a, a martyr. Not only that, and, and this is uh, very difficult to address, but a lot of these uh, marriages are between cousins, between first cousins. This uh, consangu consanguinity. Uh, and, and so because of this marriage between uh, couples, they're now seeing that the, um, the children, the offspring, are deformed. And they have actual scientists who are showing this and, and showing that this is a problem, that this is a problem. And it says here, you know, UK Muslims keep marrying first cousins, despite the horrific genetic consequences, because their scriptures say it's okay. 
But science is showing us it's not. Islam, which allows marriage of close cousins and men to children, is causing genetic disorders. The culture of these people is not allowed in Christian countries because they know how this will turn out. Islamic culture seems to be reaping what it has sown. In the UK, more than 50% of British Pakistanis marry their first cousins. In Bradford, that figure is 75%. And across the country, the practice is on the rise and also common among East African, Middle Eastern, and Bangladeshi communities. And so this uh, woman, Tazin Ahmed, says, my mom has always had a special place in her family because she was the first girl to live beyond childhood. Five of her sisters died as babies or toddlers. It was not until many years later that anyone worked out why so many children died and three boys were born deaf. Here again, there's a storm over Muslim cousin marriages that this um, government minister is under fire after he warns of a surge in disabilities. So that's now just to do with cousin marriages, or really we could say incest, where the, the Le Leviticus tells us not to marry anyone who's near of kin. Here now, this London jihadi that we've just suffered another jihad attack. So far, I think close to 700 people have died and we're just one week into Ramadan. This Ramadan goes until June 24th and the faithful are promised uh, 70 times the rewards for any killing done during Ramadan. So we're up to a body count of 700 so far and we've got another three weeks to go. I'm ready to, this is what the London jihadi said uh, just this last uh, weekend. I'm ready to do whatever I need to do in the name of Allah, including killing my own mother. So their scriptures say, do everything for Allah, even killing your own parents. This man will kill his own mother. Leviticus says, God says, that anyone who even curses his mother should be put to death because God wants to protect the family. Here these women are having children and the children turn on them because of the, the way their scriptures work. We see here now, narrated by Ibn Abbas, I, Muhammad, put on her, he's speaking of his aunt that died, I put on her my shirt that she may wear the clothes of heaven, and I slept with her. His aunt died. He went into the grave, and he slept with her in her coffin, that I may lessen the pressure of the grave. She was the best of Allah's creatures to be after Abu Talib. The Prophet was referring to Fatima, the mother of Ali, in other words, his aunt. The Arabic scholar Demetrius explains the Arabic word here used for slept is idtajad and literally means lay down with her. It is often used to mean lay down to have sex. Muhammad is understood as saying that because he slept with her, he has she has become like a wife to him, so he had to consummate the marriage. She has become like a wife to him, so she, shall, she will be considered like a mother of the believer. So since she's now his wife, he consummated the marriage with her, in heaven she will now have the reward of a mother of believers. This will supposedly prevent her from being tormented in the grave. So this was actually a, an act of compassion because she would be tormented in hell but because he consummated the marriage with her, she can now go to heaven and have the reward of the mother of the believers. Since Muslims believe that as people wait for the judgment day, they will be tormented in the grave. So all Muslims go into torment, into, into hell until judgment day, and then some go to paradise and some stay in hell, unless they die a martyr, or in this case, uh, Muhammad enables her to die the mother of the believers. And so that's what reduce the pressure uh, means. So, here now, because of this act of Muhammad, we see these fatwas uh, being passed just recently in Egypt that a man can have uh, sex with his wife's corpse. The, the Leviticus tells us it is an abomination to have any sort of relations like this, necrophilia, with the dead. It's an abomination to God. And yet their God tells them it's, it's fine. No problem at all. And we have to deal with this because the Marxists are saying these cultures are equal, even though we know the cultures are not equal. The cultures are not equal. So he says here, 
And remember, so this is now the Quran, verse uh, chapter 33, verse, um, uh, verse 37. Remember, O Muhammad, this is Allah speaking to Muhammad, when you said to the one on whom Allah bestowed favor, and you bestowed favor, keep your wife and fear Allah. So the one that uh, Muhammad bestowed favor upon was uh, his, his adopted son-in-law. He adopted this young man as his son. So he bestowed favor upon him. He was his son, uh, his adopted son, sorry. And so Allah bestowed favor on him as well through Muhammad, became his adopted son. Muhammad saw this man's wife uh, scantily dressed, and she had a beautiful body, and he lusted after her. And so Zaid, this young man, saw that Muhammad was lusting after his wife. He understood his wife shared with him what happened. And so Muhammad, uh, Zaid told Muhammad he could have her. Muhammad said to him, keep your wife and fear Allah. Allah is now talking to Muhammad and saying, you concealed within yourself that which Allah is to disclose. So Muhammad tried to hide that he really did want his, his daughter-in-law, and Allah is now disclosing it. And you feared the people. So Muhammad disclo didn't disclose it because he was afraid of what the people might think. Now he's getting this revelation from Allah that says, while Allah has more right that you fear him, so he's explaining to the people now that Allah wants him to marry his daughter-in-law. Even though Leviticus tells us this is an abomination. So when Zaid had no longer any need for her, that means he divorced her. God hates divorce. God is trying to protect the family. This God loves divorce. So when Zaid had no longer any need for her, we, that is Allah, married her to you. God hates divorce. This God God says that anybody who, who divorces a woman uh, and marries another commits adultery. And anybody who marries the one that's divorced commits adultery. This God says divorce is fine. And so we married her to you. In order that there not be upon the believers any discomfort concerning the wives of their adopted sons when they no longer have need of them. And ever is the command of Allah accomplished. So Allah is saying he did this so that the... Um, Muslims would no longer see their adopted children as real children. So, in, in, in other words, a, adoption ends here. You, m Muslims can no longer have mercy, uh, even though it was described here as bestowing favor. Muslims can't do this anymore. Another um, scripture, Abu Dawood 2150. The Apostle of Allah sent a military expedition to Atas on the occasion of the Battle of Hunayn. They met there their enemy and fought with them. They defeated them and took them captives. Some of the companions of the Apostle of Allah were reluctant to have intercourse, that is to rape, the female captives in the presence of their husbands who were unbelievers. So they conquered these people, I believe they, these were the Jews, and uh, they didn't want to rape the captive women, even though that, that's their right. They had previous revelation that says it's fine for them to rape uh, captive believers, even though God says any sexual relationship outside of the marriage bed is an abomination. Here they have a benefit from Allah that they can engage in this uh, satanic worship. So Allah, the exalted, sent down the Quranic verse, all married women are forbidden unto you except those captives whom your right hands possess. So even though these women are married, Allah is saying it doesn't matter go ahead and have sexual relations with them. That is to say, they are lawful for them when they complete their waiting period. They just had to make sure that these women were not pregnant with their husband's uh, uh, child before they go in so that they can ensure the children will be Muslim. All of these are abominations to God. A man can have sex with animals. So this is now a fatwa uh, given by Ayatollah Khomeini. A man can have sex with animals, such as sheep, cows, camels, and so on. This is again based on the Hadith. However, he should kill the animal after he has his orgasm. Pardon that. He should not sell the meat for the people in his own village. However, selling the meat to the next door village should be fine. A man can have sexual pleasure from a child as young as a baby. This girl, however, would not count as one of his four permanent wives. 
the man will not be eligible to marry the girl's sister. So these are fatwas, rulings that Muslims have to follow based on the scholars searching the hadith. Uh, Nikamuta, temporary marriage. It means pleasure marriage. It's a type of temporary contract marriage permitted in uh, Shia Islam. It's also permitted in Sunni Islam. It's called something else. Where the duration of the marriage and the mar must be specified, that's the divorce, and agreed upon in advance, or the dowry. So, in other words, it's a marriage for an hour. And we agree that after one hour we can have sexual relations, but then after one hour we're divorced. That's what uh, that, that is. Now, all of this is driven by their scriptures. And they're going to say to us that, you know, the scriptures don't say this. And, and again, what we're seeing now is terrorism everywhere. What do their scriptures say? What are they teaching us? <laughs> الحرية حلالك والوصيفة حلالك ولكل امرأة من أهل الدنيا دخلت الجنة سبعين حرية في ذلك اللقاء مدته سبعين سنة سبعين سنة من سنوات الدنيا هذا اللقاء الواحد فإذا كملت ما يقارب سبعين سنة تناديك حريتك الثانية من درجة فوق درجتك يا عبد الله يا ولي الله أليس لنا فيك نصيب كيف تكون سواء مع الحور العين أو مع المؤمنات التي دخلنا الجنة والله عز وجل قال حور عين وهي المرأة الشابة الحسناء الجميلة البيضاء شديد السواد العين في شدة البياض التي يحار الطرف فيها من رقة جلدها وصفائه وصفاء لونه وكما قال الله كأنهن بيض مكنون العيون واسعة لم يطمثهن إنس قبله ولا جان أبكار عربا أترابا متحببات لأزواجهن في سن واحدة خيرات خيرات حسان في الأخلاق والوجوه كأنهن الياقوت والمرجان في اللمعان والصفاء والنقاء والبياض كأمثال اللؤلؤ المكنون مثل صفاء الدر في الأصداف لم تمسه الأيدي كل واحدة منهن يرى مخ ساقها من وراء لحمها من الحسن هذا الجمال إذ تقول فبأي آلاء ربكما تكذبان حور مقصورات في الخيام فبأي آلاء ربكما تكذبان لم يطمثهن إنس بس أرض رب الحمد لله رب العالمين مش أكتر أول ما نحط الحزام علي يعني شعور ارتفعت ومعنويات قوية أكتر يعني مفيش لكل مسلم We need to understand what is in these scriptures. We need to understand what's in the Communist Manifesto because Marxists rule the world today. But we also need to understand what's in the Islamic scriptures because they are spreading all over the world. Every Western civilization almost is importing them and, and allowing them to, to establish themselves and to change our moral compass. What we need to understand is the power of the storyteller. The storyteller is more powerful than anybody. The man, I, I fear the storyteller more than the man who picks up a gun. Why? Because the storyteller can get the man to pick up a gun. And the storyteller can get him to put it down. The storyteller is the one who really, I, I would say it this way. We don't see with our eyes. We see with stories. And that's what Luke 15 and 16 are all about. That Christ is having dinner with sinners. And we can look with our eyes, but that doesn't tell us anything. We have to look with a story. So the Pharisees give us one story. This man eats with sinners. Therefore, he's corrupt. Therefore, he's evil. Therefore, he's a sinner. So I'm going to look at this situation of a man, a rabbi, eating with sinners, but it doesn't mean anything to me unless I have a narrative. So I could accept the Pharisees' narrative and then be resistant and hostile toward Christ. Christ is teaching his disciples how to perceive what is happening. And he does this with stories. He tells these parables, several parables, always contrasting somebody who's rich, and has all of the means in this life, but who is cruel, with somebody who has nothing, who is suffering, and who's looking for mercy 
but cannot receive it, but will receive it from God. Because God does not see things the way men see things. What, what men esteem is an abomination. And today we're seeing the same thing. Things are being held in high esteem, and God sees them as an abomination. And so we need to understand what story are we going to use to view the world? Are we going to stick with the biblical narrative and the story that Christ shares with us? Or are we going to accept somebody else's narrative that, that gets us to see up is down and down is up and good is evil and evil is good? We need to stick with the biblical narrative. And so now, in addition now to telling these people how evil they are uh, around divorce and, and the need to be faithful to marriage, as God is faithful to his marriage covenant, he now continues with another story. Now again, bear in mind, this is just a story. At the beginning of 16, Christ told his disciples a story about an unfaithful or an unjust steward. It was just a story. That's all it was. It was just a story. But what Christ was doing was he was saying, here, put on this lens and see the situation through this narrative. And so because of that narrative, he's shaping how they see what's in front of them. Now, he turns to another story. The purpose of this story, it's just a made up story. The purpose of the story is to shape our perception, to shape the perception of the disciples. And this is the story of Lazarus and the rich man. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen. So he was very wealthy. And he fared sumptuously every day. <laughs> These are, you know, this is a community that they would fare sumptuously on the feast days. But, you know, between feasts, they would just barely eke out a living for most of them. But this man fared sumptuously every day. He was dressed in purple and fine linen. The linen indicates he's a Pharisee. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which is uh, Greek for Eleazar, which means God helps. So there was a beggar that God helps, full of sores, who was laid at his gate. He was laid at the rich man's gate. Desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So this man was in quite a terrible condition, especially when you consider that dogs were considered unclean to the Jews, and, and this man couldn't even resist the dogs coming, and even the dogs are better off than him. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried again. Christ keeps coming back to this contrast between those who have, who are unfaithful stewards in this life, and those who are poor, who have nothing. And the, the mercilessness of those who have. So remember the two brothers, the, the prodigal son, came back as the beggar. And the, rich, the, the, the son who still had his inheritance, who was wealthy, didn't want to share anything with him. And so, so Christ just keeps reinforcing this so that we understand, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And so this story is, is just a parable. The same way that the story of the unjust steward was just a made-up story. This is just a made-up story. The beggar dies and he's carried to the angels by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off, and Lazarus was in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham. So he's now appealing. <laughs> he's now appealing to the family relationship. We're, we're family here. We're, we're, we share the same DNA. You're my father. Uh, father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. So now he's looking for mercy from the, from the man who had nothing. He had everything. He wouldn't share anything. He was covetous and a lover of money. Wouldn't share anything with Lazarus. Now Lazarus is in Abraham's bosom and all he wants is a drop of water 
to cool his tongue. Now, remember at the beginning of Luke, where John warned Israel to bear fruits worthy of repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. Don't, don't lean on that. Don't, don't think that just because you have Abraham as your father, you get a pass. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones, and even now the axe is laid to the root of the tree. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So this parable is really uh, articulating what, what John warned them about. Now listen to how Abraham re responds. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime, you, when, when you, were at a, uh, you had temporary things, uh, you were not faithful with, with what was not even yours. Remember that in your lifetime you received your good things and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed. So that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. And again, people try to use this parable to justify a belief in heaven and hell. This is saying no such thing. The Bible is very, very clear that when we die, we're dead until the resurrection. All of these false religions teach that when you die, you're not really dead. You keep on living. The Bible says when you die, you're dead. And I'm going to uh, put in the chat um, and on Facebook a sermon that uh, Pastor Murray just did on what happens after you die. So if you have any questions about what the Bible says about death and what happens when you die, that's a great sermon. I'm also going to put in the chat a sermon that Deacon Jan did on the resurrection. And he talks specifically about Lazarus and the rich man and how our misunderstanding and, and uh, corruption by Greek philosophy uh, has influenced how we perceive this scripture. Does a very, he's a very technical man, does a very technical job of, of unpacking this and making it clear this is just a parable. It's just a story that Christ is using to shape how we see the Pharisees and how we see the poor. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, again appealing to the family relationship, that you would send him to my, so you won't send him to me, send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers. And again, in, in Deacon Jan's sermon, he talks about Judah having five brothers. And so this rich man is really a, a, a symbol of Judah. And, and again, the Pharisees that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And again, in the prophets, in Deuteronomy and in Moses, uh, it's very clear how Israel is to treat the poor. They're to have compassion on the poor. So God gives them uh, resources as his stewards, and he expects them to take those resources and look after the poor. Because they loved money, they were neglecting their duty and they were just looking after themselves. So they have Moses and they have, you can read here in Deuteronomy, uh, how to uh, support the poor, how to look after the fatherless and the widow. Uh, and if there is a poor man of your brethren, so he's saying, Father Abraham, we're family. Well, Moses is telling them that the poor are family, but they didn't care. So in Luke 16, 30, he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, then they will repent. But he said to them, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Truer words were never spoken. Because Christ himself rose from the dead. And still they don't believe. Still people want to doubt the crucifixion. And put it down. They just there are so many witnesses. They're still putting it down. They don't want to believe. So even if one were sent to them from the dead, if they love money, if money is their god, if their god is themselves, if their god is Satan, it doesn't matter. They're going to find a reason to disbelieve. And so Abraham in this parable says, "Leave them alone. They have Moses. They have the prophets. Today we have Moses and the prophets, and we can search the biblical narrative." and understand it, and use that to see the world. Or we can neglect the biblical narrative, 
and accept all kinds of other ideologies that are going to teach us that what is evil is actually good, and what is good is evil. And we can't serve God and money. So we're either going to love God and put him first before everything, or we're going to end up with a corrupt heart that leans toward idolatry. So here's, a, like we said Moses and in Deuteronomy, we see how he should treat the poor. But here in Isaiah, in the prophets, it makes it clear, and that's why again, Lazarus or Eleazar, uh, God helps the poor. The Lord stands up to plead and stands to judge the people. The Lord will enter into judgment with the elders of his people and his princes. He's in, he's in a controversy with them. For you have eaten up the vineyard. The plunder of the poor is in your houses. You should be helping the poor. You're taking what they have away from them. What do you mean by crushing my people and grinding the faces of the poor, says the Lord God of hosts. So if we see the world through the biblical narrative, we're going to be very clear on God's standard of morality. We're not going to get confused and we're not going to deviate from it. And we're also going to be very clear on God's compassion for the poor. And to understand that when God came to announce the kingdom, he came announcing compassion for the poor. So all of this is in the context that we can't serve two masters. And so these stories are to get the disciples and us to see through the narrative that the kingdom of God is being established and we must do all we can to press into it and not be double-minded and not have anything before Christ. And so you'll remember the scriptures in Luke and in, and in Luke 15. Um, we'll just wrap up here. But in Luke 1, again, he's for the poor. And this parable is just fulfilling what he announced or what the scriptures announced. That Christ has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. So let's not be fooled. As, as people gain wealth in this world and, and abuse it, this is temporary. We need to focus on the eternal wealth. We need to focus on, on Christ coming back. And, and we're 2,000 years from Pentecost, and we're heading towards the fulfillment of the Feast of Trumpets, which is the return of Christ, soon and very soon. And so we'll just conclude here, again reminding you of the scriptures in Luke 16 and, and Luke 13, which are giving context to these stories. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other. And that's what we're seeing now uh, with these false narratives, that people are, uh, because they love a certain master, they are telling stories to try to support that narrative and so I think you we all know about these uh, fake news stories and uh, th this is all about manipulating people so that the wolf is the victim and the three little pigs well they're the, they're the bad guys they should they should be prosecuted and sent to jail and executed and the wolf should walk free we can we can twist and turn people's perspectives through storytelling and 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 certainly the media understand this and they are they are relentless in using stories to twist people's heads. And so we need to be very, very clear on the power of the narrative. No servant can serve two masters. If we get mixed up, we're going to hate Christ and love Satan. So we can't serve both God and money. We can't be idolaters. And, and again, this, this parable is really underlining there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And this is what God is trying to get us to avoid. So he's using these stories so that we can be on the right side. And these people are going to see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God. And they themselves thrust out. So that, that then brings us now to the end of uh, Luke 16. And uh, we will then go on uh, next week to Luke 17. And I believe we'll start to get into some uh, prophecy. Again, pointing us towards the fulfillment of the Feast of Trumpets. But... Here we see in, in these last two chapters, especially, the power of the storyteller. Jesus Christ is the creator, and he comes to establish the kingdom by telling stories. And that if we accept the biblical narrative, we will see clearly. We will see reality. We will not be confused, 
and we will not be influenced by evil men. In fact, what we can do now is we can influence evil men. We can preach the gospel without apology and get people to understand the truth and repent of their evil deeds and come to Jesus Christ, our Lord and their Lord, our Savior and our King. God bless.